So today is Mandala Day, celebrated today on July 23, 2023. And indeed, it is a most amazing day. What were those last couple of lines of the Song of Zazen? Anybody remember? Here we are, in this very place, in this very body, for however long we may have it. How wondrous. We're so fortunate to be here in Syracuse. The planet is burning up. Today we can breathe. Tomorrow we don't know. But our friends in Houston, Miami, India, China, and even the so-called temperate zones of Europe. Pretty scary. So, with thanks for being here with deep awareness for those who are dealing with this terrible heat and flood and fire. For our Dharma brother, Fugan, whose father is at the end of his life. We embrace them all. So I've been thinking particularly strongly about Myogen Senzaki because I've been in touch with someone who wrote out of the blue, as it were, from Japan. Her name is Masayo Suemura. And she wrote, I do research on American Zen, in particular on Yogan Senzaki. It just so happened that her email arrived during Yogan Senzaki's session. Who was one of Japanese Zen pioneers in the US? I am at Nanzan Institute for Religion and Culture in Japan. Please forgive me for contacting you without previous notice. I send this email to apply for summer interim residency at Stavisatsu Zendo and ask for your cooperation in the survey of Nyogen Senzaki. I plan to conduct research on Nyogen Senzaki on the east and west coasts of the United States this August. If you permit me to do so, I would like to see the Senzaki materials DBZ has and take photos of them during the independent study and personal time in the interim schedule. So she is coming August 3rd.
So I wrote back inviting her to come and stay a little longer than she had planned. And she wrote back, Thank you very much for your reply. It is a great pleasure and honor to hear from you, the author of Eloquent Silence. I have always researched your book as well as Like a Dream, Like a Fantasy, and Namudai Bosa for reference. In your book, I think it is very good that you have used photos of Senzaki's poems. I would be grateful if you could show me calligraphies that were in Senzaki's collection, etc., if possible. And she's hoping to meet with Shubin Tanahashi's relative, only one I know that is still alive is her granddaughter, Lisa, in Los Angeles. So we are trying to arrange that. I am not good at speaking or listening to English. In DBZ, to communicate accurately, I may use a translation application if necessary. Please forgive my rudeness. I am sorry. Thank you for arranging transportation from bus. I am very much looking forward to seeing you. So fortunately, right now, Kushu, who speaks Japanese, is at DBZ, and he will pick her up at the bus. And Jim, one of our few residents, is half Japanese, and he too can help. And he's our archivist, so he can find materials that will be helpful for her. It's been 15 years since the time, 2008, when Ada Roshi and I and a few others went to Seattle. And we went to Nyogen Senzaki's grave. We offered incense and chanting. And at that time, I had the manuscript of Eloquent Silence. So even though it was just in a, a black notebook, they put that on the grave. And that night, we were sitting in a restaurant, and Ada Roshi gave some words that every we've, we've repeated since, but I want to tell you again now. He said, who was Nyogen Senzaki? No one. Where did he come from? No knowing. What did he do? Nothing. <laughs> and that's why he said 50 years later, 2008, he is not forgotten. And in a Taisho he gave May 3rd, 2008, which was during the first Nyogen Senzaki commemorative session, which we've been doing every year ever since. It used to be Memorial Day session in May. He said, in 50 years, a few students may requite Nyogen Senzaki's life, the hardship 
we face, enduring such homesickness, loneliness, racism, poverty, and when he said that, it really made me think Americans have taken up Zen practice after all. How much do we take for granted? We assume that Zen is ours for the taking. Fifteen years now, we've had the disruption of the pandemic. We have worsening climate crises. How is Zen practice in America? This summer session, we have 20 people, only 15 from this Sangha. Five are coming from elsewhere. They are Zen Study Society students who are traveling from North Carolina, from New York City, and elsewhere. How is Zen practice at Hoenji? Where are the students? We have to really ask ourselves, are we requiting the extraordinary efforts of Nyogen Senzaki, his teacher, Son Shaku Roshi, D.T. Suzuki Sensei, and Edo Shimano Roshi, Soen Nakagawa Roshi, all of these great pioneers that we celebrate on Mandala Day. It's one thing to have a service in commemoration. It's another to make our lives the commemoration. So I'm very grateful that you are here today, every one of you. Those of you who have not signed up for session, think. So many, many of you know the story of Nyogen Senzaki's life when Edo Roshi asked that question, who was Nyogen Senzaki? I'm sure you remember he was found by a monk as an infant next to his mother's dead body in Siberia or on the Mongolian border. Anyway, He was taken in by the Senzaki family and his adoptive mother also died when he was five. And he was raised by his adoptive grandfather who was a Buddhist priest who taught him the Chinese classics and the ideals of what it meant to be 
a Buddhist, and I wanted to just remind you of that relationship. When he was teaching him, Yogan Senzaki later wrote, it was to live up to the Buddhist ideals outside of name and fame and to avoid as far as possible the world of loss and gain. So his grandfather passed away when Yogan Senzaki was 16. And before he died, he said, he warned him actually, don't join the ranks of Buddhist priests a pack of tigers and wolves. There are some interesting quotes that I want to share with you in this talk. Uh, one is from Namu Daibo Sa, from uh, Lou Nordson's. Introduction. And he speaks of Nyogen Senzaki's humility and his concern that intellectual accomplishment be considered secondary to the practice of Zen and the observance of the Buddhist precepts. I'll quote, although he emphasizes the importance of what he calls free thinking throughout his work, Yogan Senzaki was acutely aware of the dangers of an overdeveloped intellect and an underdeveloped hara. I think that pretty well describes everybody who comes here in the beginning. An overdeveloped intellect and an underdeveloped hara. Then he goes on. Yogan Senzaki was ordained under a Shingon teacher, which is the esoteric school of Buddhism. And continued with his ordination in Soto Zen and then finally going to Rinzai Zen with his teacher Son Shaku Roshi. And later on, in 1901, Son Shaku had this to say of his student. If there be a monk like Jofukyo in the Lotus Sutra who retains no thought of an ego or person, who uses his hands for nothing but loving kindness, like a mother washing and wrapping her baby in swaddling clothes, if this monk walk everywhere to make himself a cradle for baby Buddhas, considering the boys and girls of this world as if they were his own children. If he shakes hands with paupers and nobles alike, treating them as his own companions, and if he form a sangha here and there, as the home of the Dharma, though he himself remains a homeless monk, where all are invited to come. Though there be neither host nor teacher to invite them. Such a monk speaks a plain humanity, which is Buddhist truth. If there be such a monk, I will pay homage to him with tears of love and admiration. Mm. 
Brother Nyogen is a nameless and penniless monk. He goes unrecognized both in and out of monasteries. He has only an aspiration for loving kindness with which no honored position can compare. He is bold enough to establish the mentor garden with no other assets than his accumulated knowledge of Buddhism and modern thought. As Buddha said, a grass leaf establishes itself a pagoda of Buddhas past, present, and future. Such an amazing letter he wrote for his student who had no success whatsoever at anything he tried. When he was young, he thought maybe he would become a doctor. And so he was thinking, okay, I will go to medical school. But then he thought, I have such a debt to the congregants of my grandfather's temple who have supported me all these years of my young life. I have to give my life to the Dharma, even though my grandfather said, beware of becoming one of those. Buddhist monks. So he finally went to <coughs> So in Shakuroshi's temple, Angakuji. But throughout his life, he was plagued by illness. He wasn't able to finish. He returned to his native village. and started the mentor garden, which I will read a small section about. This is what he told some students later, the way he taught in this village, this poverty-stricken village where the children were completely neglected and no one had enough to eat. First he said, we are all children of the Buddha, who is our ideal. And then he wrote in this letter, every morning before I opened the playhouse, I burned incense and meditated for half an hour. I did not, however, recount colorful religious stories for the children. I only guided and watched over them, helping them to learn about nature while they were playing. Sometimes I called to their attention a sunrise or sunset, or the different shapes of the beautiful moon, or the stars scattered in the heavens. As for their manners, I just tried to train them to be in a harmonious relationship with their parents. So, much as he tried to gain support for this mentor garden, this kindergarten that he was hoping to establish for these impoverished children. Japan was dealing with a great deal of trouble. It was 
an economic crisis, the Sino, uh, the Sino, Sino Russo War was going on, and there was no money for any such thing as what was considered by the establishment entirely unnecessary because this little village didn't merit consideration, much less the children and women whom he was so involved with. And I was remembering a sort of similar situation in my life when we were living in Clinton, New Jersey. It was a place in Hunterdon County, very rural at the time. We were on uh, Highway Route 22. We had found this um, house, this beautiful old house built in the 1700s. You know Washington slept here, that kind of thing, with his troops, actually. And we had no money because uh, my stepfather was quite a character and he was fired from his job teaching art in the local high school after kicking a student down the stairs. And he was doing his artwork. We had a big sign out front on Route 22, which was a truck route. Trucks would be dashing by. So his sign said, Shayat, hand wrought jewelry and sculpture. No truck stopped. <laughs> and my mother, meanwhile, was teaching remedial reading in a little town called Califon, also very rural. And it had been established as a place for prisoners. And after a while, the next generation was born, and the generation after that, and they were all truly impoverished, very much like Yogan Senzaki's village. In the winter, she would stand on the playground, and the little ones would crawl under her coat to keep warm. They had no coats. A lot of them didn't even have shoes. And so it was an interesting time. I remember her taking off to go and teach in this ancient pierced arrow that she had. It only had enough water in the radiator, which leaked, to get from our house to the school. And then she would have some kids help her put water in before she went back. So I really resonate deeply with these early years of Nyogen Senzaki and the people he was helping. Anyway, his teacher, as you know, was the first Zen priest to go to the United States, what was he going to? Hmm? Yeah, the 1893 World Parliament of Religions in Chicago. Are you going, Jaraka? Jaraka will be going to this event um, in Chicago in what, a week? Two weeks. Yeah. So it keeps going on. Togon and I went, I think it was in 2016. Anyway, he went there, um, Soen Shaku went there and gave a talk, which was very badly translated, had very little to do with his actual text. And, um, and then he returned in 1905 at the invitation of the first American student of Zen, a woman named Ida Russell, who had begun practicing before Soen Shaku came to Chicago. 
and had her own very uh, interesting group of people around her. And so he invited, Soen Shaku invited Nyogen Sensaku to go as well, thinking he might actually be able to raise funds for his mentor garden. But again, Nyogen Sensaku got sick. He had an eye infection, a contagious infection. So he had to wait and ended up taking a freighter to uh, Seattle and made his way down to where his teacher was staying at the home of the Russells, where now Soin Shaku is accompanied by another of his disciples, D.T. Suzuki. So this is the mandala as it unfolds. Yogan Senzaki got there, but I guess he was kind of bedraggled, unkempt. He didn't have the distinguished presence of D.T. Suzuki as a young monk. And for one reason or another, he was not welcome. And like a mother tiger kicking her cub down the cliff, his teacher told him, wait before you start teaching any Zen. Go and do what you can, and we'll see what happens. And many years went by. He finally found a place where he could teach from 1922 on, and it was uh, in San Francisco, and he regarded it as his mentor garden for adult students of Zen. Then he moved, we don't know why, but it said maybe 1929, maybe 1931. No one knows much about why he did whatever he did other than being a true Buddhist monk. But he ended up moving to Los Angeles. And that's where he lived the rest of his life. And that's where the mandala was activated. When I say that, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Yes? What happened in Los Angeles? Mm. Why? How did that happen? I remember I just said the first Zen student in America was a woman named Ida Russell. Now, how did he know to reach out to Soenakagawa, young monk? Who's he read one of his haikus. Mm -hmm. He read one of his haiku and uh, He read. Yeah. Who showed it to him? Thank you. Shubin Tanahashi, who we may say is really at the center of this mandala. Mm -hmm. She was just a Japanese lady running a small dry cleaning laundry shop with her husband. And one day, this monk walked in. I know you've all read the story, so you probably can tell it to me. And he dropped off his clothes to be washed. And then what? He didn't come back. He didn't come back. So one day, she was out and wheeling the wheelchair with her son, Jimmy, who had Down syndrome. And she saw him. And she said, Oh, monk, why don't you come and pick up your clothes? They've been ready for you for quite a long time. And he said, I have no money. I'm so sorry. I will come and get them. 
when I can. So she said, you can have them today. I really would like to ask you, could you help me? My son cannot speak, cannot walk. He has many developmental problems. She didn't put it that way, but that's how we would say it. And it would be wonderful if you could take a little time and be with him. And I will give you your clothes today. And so that began the relationship between them. And she became his beloved disciple, much as Ida Russell became Soren Chaka's disciple and even spent time in Japan studying with him. So this old Japanese lady was a key element in the mandala. And she helped him find a little apartment. And he began holding Zazen there. And he called it Tozen Zenkutsu. Next time you go to Dadasatsu Zendo, look at the plaque over the entry door. It's from Nyogen Senzaki's little zendo. It says, Tozen Zenkutsu, the meditation hall of the eastbound teaching. Of course, when he wrote that, he was thinking, coming from the west to the east, who was that? Bodhidharma. He had no idea that this plaque would go east to New York State, the Catskill Mountains. And so he established the Mentor Garden Sangha with a few American students joining and Shubin Tanahashi. And he was taking care of Jimmy. And one day she showed him. This is the part where some of you remember. She showed him Soen, Monk Soen's poem in a women's magazine that she subscribed to. And he read it, and he was so astonished by how wonderful they were. And then, as I read earlier today, they wanted so badly to meet, but hostilities had already begun. No ships crossed the Pacific Ocean. And in fact, a year later, Yogan Senzaki himself was imprisoned in Heart Mountain internment camp, internment camp. And throughout the war, that's where he lived. And they finally met on Buddha's birthday, April 8, 1949. And again, I wanted to read something to you from uh, Endless Vow, this beautiful section, page here. This is by Soen Nakagawa Roshi. It's called Arriving at the Other Shore. Mm -hmm. The great round mirror of the boundless ocean has disappeared in the dark blue night. This boat is now speeding toward the east. Eastbound boat at 21 knots per hour at a north latitude of 130 degrees bound for a country of science, for a country of atomic bombs. 1949. 
The General Gordon is a huge white dragon chewing its way through the cresting waves of eternal eons samsara and shooting seven huge rainbows across the dome of the sky. Assembled on the deck are a Jewish painter, a Canadian journalist, a Polish missionary, and a Japanese physicist. All share a bowl of tea served by this wandering monk. Do you or do you not know, hidden in this bowl of tea is a secret, more secret than all of atomic science. What is the secret? He's about to tell us. All things are born of interrelated conditions. Therefore, not a thing has a separate identity because there is no separate identity. This one bowl can contain even more than the Pacific Ocean. Not coming, not going, not attaining, thus, in the end, empty. In this way, even if I thoroughly penetrate into the emptiness of the three billion great worlds, still there is more emptiness to fathom. And tomorrow morning I will arrive at the other shore, San Francisco. What a relationship they had. And what did he do? As Itaroshi asked and said, nothing. And we may consider this his greatest teaching for us, Yogan Senzaki. Nothing. Or, as Master Rinzai put it, Bhuji, nothing to do. Just quietly living this life of a mushroom monk. So while I was contemplating all of this, just after our 2008 trip to LA, I received an email from someone, some of you know, Chogan Renee Berblinger, who lives in Portland, who we are going to try to visit. I cannot read it to you yet. I have to relate it to the poem that Nyogen Senzaki wrote July 7th, 1955, the same year he made his one and only visit to Japan and three years before his death. So here is Nyogen Senzaki. In a dream, I'm lying in a pagoda with my old teacher. When I awaken, I am on my single pillow in the Western Hemisphere. For more than 70 years, I have floated on the Elias Sea in this illusory boat. I use that poem as the frontispiece for eloquent silence 
But then I had received this poem before it came out from Chogan. Sitting quietly upright as the continuous waves gently rock the boat, pushing me ever farther out to sea.